So welcome to the podcast, Kate. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to have you. First of all, I absolutely loved your book. Um, you know, what's interesting. I listened to it as an audiobook because of my crazy schedule last year. And um, I just wasn't able to like sit down and read. And sometimes I find when I'm like driving and listening to an audiobook, I can't really follow what people are saying because I kind of like lose interest or the voice, but your voice and the way you read it and like everything really kept me captivated. And I also oh, thought thank you. you shared so much. Um, we're going to obviously get to that, but before we do, I'd love for you to share your background and how you began to see how the menstrual cycle can impact work and how you began to observe. I, I know that you obviously have a background because your mom's taught you a lot. So probably got that into your perspective, um, but would love to hear you share about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did grow up with a mom who's a holistic OBGYN. So I certainly learned about the menstrual cycle early and um, you know was aware of the metaphor Force for creativity and the connection with the moon. But to be honest, I really wasn't that interested in it. I was just sort of like, okay, whatever, mom. <laughs> uh, like my kid. <laughs> yeah. um, and now I have two daughters of my own. So I'm like, I'm sure I'll get mine. Um, <laughs> um, it wasn't until I got my period back after the birth of my first daughter I had gone through an incredibly difficult first year of motherhood, which I know is not unusual. Um, you know, between my own mental health problems, her physical health problems, lack of sleep, lack of support, mastitis, birth trauma, you know, whole, whole bunch of things. And so when my period came back, it was this amazing return to myself um, that, and she was 13 months old when I, when I got it back and I hadn't had a period for, of course, the nine months that I was pregnant, but then also, uh, for at least six or nine months before that as well. Mm, um, I got one that. period and then I got pregnant. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So that's like a whole other, well, you, this is a fertility podcast, so this yeah. is really relevant. I did this super intense fitness program to get ready for my wedding and I lost so much body fat that I, I lost my period. Yeah. Yeah. That Hypothalamic was not, amenorrhea. no good. <laughs> yeah. That was not awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I did all this work to get it back and, and then I got it back once and then, and then I got pregnant. So basically like I didn't have a period for two and a half years and it came back after the birth of my first daughter. And I, for whatever reason, I was just so excited. I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm back. Like I am emerging from the underworld, which really that first year with a baby felt like being in the underworld. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were many sweet moments. <laughs> um, and so I was so excited to learn about it and to start tracking it. And I think that for me, I felt so massively out of control in my experience of motherhood that there was something so grounding and so calming about the reliability of my period and the mm -hmm. predictability of the cyclical nature of just knowing like this is going to happen and then this is going to happen and then this is going to happen. And so I, I really started to lean on it as a tremendous source of solace. And then also as this beautiful framework for organizing my new life as a working mom, you know, I had run a business for years up until then, but that now, now I was like, I have this other being who depends on me for her survival. And I just like, you know, love her so much it hurts. And so I'd never had that much of a dual focus before. And yeah. so it required a whole new way of being. And my, my, my cycle, and then also the lunar cycle became the groundwork, the foundation for this whole new way of being. It is. And, and so how did you figure out to utilize all the different phases in the menstrual cycle? Well, 
I mean, again, I was, I knew about them. So I not only had I been raised by my mom, Christian Northrup, and I had certainly read the menstrual cycle chapter of Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom. I had also read um, Woman Code by Elisa Vitti. Yeah. And so again, like I had heard about it. It wasn't yeah. completely brand new, but anytime, you know, honestly, when I had read Woman Code by Elisa, I was just like, yeah, <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> like, I was like, I'm not going to eat sweet potatoes at one part of my cycle. And then like these other kind of beans at another part. Like it, I just quite honestly, it felt, it sounded hard and complicated. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, no. Yeah. And having never had any menstrual health problems, it just didn't seem like something I needed to do. But then- This is before, before. This is before, before you- Before, before. This is like yeah. babies. Right. You know, I was running around New York City, just, you know, I thought I had too much going on to yeah. pay attention to my body. <laughs> um, and so, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think when it came back, I just, I just was, got interested and I just started, I'm just like that. Like I get curious about something and then I buy all the books and I read all the things and I just, I research everything I can possibly learn about it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know why I'm like that, but I am. And so I started to write, so previous to Do Less, I had written another book called Money, A Love Story. And so up until 2017, my business had been about teaching people how to heal their relationship with money. So as I was getting excited about the menstrual cycle, I came up with this idea. I was like, I'm going to write a blog post about how to organize your financial actions around the phases of the moon or the phases of your menstrual cycle. So you can get the, so you can kind of get organized with this cosmic and biological support and hormonal support behind you. And I just started geeking out. I got so psyched. And then that was really, it was creating that blog post and creating this freebie download about it that just turned me on to this whole idea that, wait a second, I could organize my, if I could organize my financial action steps around this, I could organize my whole business and my That's whole so cool. life around this. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and it really is something that a lot of people don't realize that your psyche is affected by your cycle. It, it really is. And you can utilize these different phases. Um, sometimes, I mean, we've all been there. We've all been trying to be creative and come up with ideas when we're just not in that place. And it takes us like five hours to come up with one idea where it could take us like less than a few minutes if we're like in that window or, you know, our mind it, like is feeling it. So we're kind of working against our flow in a sense. I mean, um, one thing that I definitely took notice to and I thought about, I also had a background. I used to work in this New York City. I was an architect. That was my previous life. So I know how male dominant the corporations are, especially, I mean, they used to be worse. It used to be worse. Now it's kind of changing a little bit. Um, but I know how that is. And, I, and interestingly enough, I had cycle issues all my life, really. And then around that time is when I went and I went to see an acupuncturist and got regular. But my point is, is that a lot of women going through fertility challenges, listening to this right now, and a lot of my patients that have come in, come from this male dominant workplace. So they have to work within those confines and a cycle that just does not flow with a female energy at all. And I feel like you had mentioned it obviously in the way of productivity, but then I heard, I saw it in so many different ways, just like you did, you know, how your mom kind of taught you about the cycles and you learn about it. And then you can see, it's almost like this hologram that you can apply to everything. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, you know, obviously fertility challenges are on the rise. And, you know, what's different about today is that a lot of women work and work and work and work in a male dominant society or, or workplace. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Like how can that, that can just the same way that our cycle can impact our productivity, our work can impact our cycle as well. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. So, you know, the, the conversation that is on the rise right now about the menstrual cycle as a vital sign, as the fifth vital sign is yeah. such an important conversation. And we all need to be treating 
using our menstrual cycle as this incredible barometer mm -hmm. for our health and getting to know it on that level, like really tracking and really paying attention and really getting to know ourselves. And to me, it's one of the most loving acts. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about self-love in this personal development world a lot. And it's like, what is, I, how do I love myself? Like, what does that even mean? Right. Yeah. Is that affirmations? Is that a massage? Like, what is that? You know? And so True. for me, tracking my cycle and getting to know my body through paying attention mm -hmm. has been one of the most practical ways of loving myself. And so what's so cool about it you know, kind of from almost the biohacking perspective is mm -hmm. it gives you so much information about yourself. So for mm -hmm. example, right now in my life, I have a pretty short cycle and I've been learning about that. It's only 24, it's only 24 days right now. And that's a little, it's, it's within the normal range, but it's like a little on the shorter side. And for you, I would prefer, for, your, for, for your normal. Yeah. For my normal. Yeah. I would prefer, because <laughs> now this you're going to learn I'm a control <laughs> freak. I would prefer... <laughs> <laughs> that it was longer because I really like it when I get one period a month because it's better. It's like better for my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so the way I am talking about this is so symptomatic of our culture. So it's good because I'm a great example. <laughs> like, <laughs> so there's a lot of things I want to say all at the same time, but basically like we have this idea that we want our bodies to fit within the lives that we have created and the lives that we have created are based on a patriarchal toxic mm -hmm. capitalistic system, which is about taking all of the resources and not thinking through sustainability. Oh yes. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So just the mere fact that I want to lengthen my cycle so that it only comes once a month so it's more predictable is also symptomatic of this, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not bad or good, it just is. So I mentioned it to my mom the other day and I was like, hey mom, I've got this 24 day cycle. It's like, you know, my period's coming a little more often. What should I do about that? And it was so wise what she said. She said, well, first of all, that's not bad. So there's nothing wrong with it. Second of all, if you are getting right, because when we have our period, we are the most intuitive. So our left and right hemispheres are the most interconnected that they will be throughout the entire month. So we have access to our inner wisdom in a way we do not at other times. And she said, you're just getting more intuitive downloads right now. And she said, women who go that. off the pill often will get two periods a month to catch up for all the downloads they missed while they were on the pill. Oh my God. Your mom is like this, uh, I, I see her like this goddess, like healer female she has she's very downloaded with this female goddess um healer yeah. shaman energy <laughs> totally and it was but so she knows it was this just, stuff you know it was so the thing is we just like are so programmed to find our bodies wrong yeah and this is me like this is, i literally teach this i also grew up with it and yet there i am standing in my mother's kitchen finding my body wrong, Say right? No with more. Her I, me, like, I, I know exactly what you're it. saying. I, I do the same thing. I teach and I don't always walk the talk. <laughs> so, yeah. but it's, it's just normal. Listen, we're messengers. Exactly. You know, so the, but the <laughs> other piece here. So first of all, I sort of like ended with the punchline, which I'm terrible at telling stories, which, <laughs> <laughs> but basically like our, our menstrual cycles are here to give us really great information. It's not bad or good. It's just data. And so I have also been learning that increased stress, which can often come from working too mm -hmm. much or feeling stressed, can, um, can mess with our cycle. So Absolutely. I was in this whole mindset of like, oh, I'm doing my life wrong. I must be too stressed out. Therefore, my cycle is wrong. But instead, looking at it from this alternative perspective of like, no, I'm accessing more downloads. That's yeah. so cool. I'm getting more frequent downloads. So Anyway, yes, the way we work can affect our cycle. And yes, our cycle can affect the way we work. And it's really a beautiful dance between the two. And the more we infuse our work life with our cyclical ebbs and flows, and the more we let our cycle become representative of where we may need to pay more attention in our personal life and in our work life, the more like it just becomes this beautiful feedback loop 
where the better it gets, the better it gets, the better it gets. And we, we're, we're, we're not left wondering like what the heck's going on with me because we just have this incredible feedback loop built right in if we just learn how to track it and how to pay attention. It's so fascinating. And yeah. like, to me, it's like endless, endless fodder for improved health, improved awareness, my spiritual connection. It's just like, there's so much there. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And you know what? Something that actually came to my mind as you were talking about loving yourself. What do you do when you love somebody? What's the biggest gift you can give them? Listen, listen. when you listen and pay attention to them, that's the biggest gift you can give them. And, and by listening to your cycle, you're actually giving yourself that ultimate self-love of hearing what your body has to say. Yeah. And I just love the fact that it's like non-judgment. So it's a little less maybe your body's doing, you're, you're getting something or it's downloading and it's okay. Like the body knows how to regulate itself. I mean, I get that sometimes I have my patients and I say, it's like a boat, you know, if there's like a weight on one side of the boat and we take that off, it's going to tilt the other way. And it's going to be a little out of balance, out of whack before it comes back to normal. Sometimes that happens in order to regulate. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. And um, so I love the, let's talk about the menstrual cycle phases. Um, and it, one, one thing, I listened to your audiobook twice, <laughs> but it was like, I really wished I would have been able to read it. Then I'm probably going to get the, the actual book so I can see and I can go back to the different phases and, and the different things that you had on there. But let's talk about the menstrual cycle phases we had spoken a little bit briefly about the menstrual cycle when we actually get our period um, and how we're connected and, and both our hemispheres are more intuitive. Um, can you take us through like starting from the period into all the different phases? Absolutely. So the period is like our personal winter. And so just like the um, we have four seasons, we have four phases of the cycle, just like we have four primary uh, phases of the lunar cycle, we have four menstrual phases. This is obviously not by accident. So the personal winter is the menstrual phase. It can be a little confusing because the entire mind cycle is also called the menstrual cycle, yeah, but there's a menstrual I know. phase, that, right? Yeah. But that's right. when you're bleeding, it's when you have your period. You know, it lasts anywhere from like three to six days, depending on who you are. Um, and that really is the time for rest and reflection. And your brain will be the most wired for intuition at that time. It's a great time for making decisions. It's a great time for going within and listening for what wisdom might want to come through about what seeds to plant and what changes to make in this next cycle that you're embarking upon. Um, in our, you know, the, in the way we track cycles, the day you get your period is day one, even though the whole thing is cyclical. So there's not really a day one. So the next phase after the menstrual phase is the follicular phase. And the follicular phase is like your personal springtime. It's a time of uh, planning and initiating. It's a time of um, new beginnings. And so this is a very fresh energy. It's a time when you will want, be more likely to want to try new things and innovate and get started with things. So if you're somebody who has trouble starting things, you really wanna focus on the follicular phase and really mark where that is in your calendar and take advantage of that sort of, you know, six days or so of the follicular, follicular phase. Next is your ovulation phase. And your ovulation phase is the day you ovulate, but also kind of like the couple days before and the couple days after. And this is your time of peak fertility. Now, of course, Michelle, you could talk so much better about this than I can, but technically you actually can only get pregnant in a very small window, but you have a longer fertile window because right. of you know how long sperm can live can stay alive. Right. But anyway, we don't need to get into that. <laughs> from an energetic perspective, <laughs> I am not telling you this from a getting no, pregnant no, it's perspective. Good, but it's a good, this um... from, a, from an energetic perspective, yeah. um, which is that this is your time that you are the most open and receptive to cross-pollination, collaboration, and being visible. Mm -hmm. um, your pheromones are the most powerful at this time. So you will literally be the most attractive and magnetic, but you will also energetically be the most attractive and magnetic. So that's your personal summer. 
And then you have your personal autumn, which is the 10 to 12 days ish before your period comes. It's called the luteal phase. And the luteal phase is the time when you turn inward. So the more yin inward phases of your cycle are luteal and menstrual. And the more yang outward phases of your cycle are the uh, follicular and ovulation. Now, a lot of women will say, well, I just don't feel like myself right during let's say the luteal phase or when she has her period i really would love to invite us to say we are actually ourselves the whole time we are just different parts of ourselves and our culture has brainwashed us to believe that one is better than the other mm -hmm. but that is just brainwashing because there's huge benefit in the more inward phases of the luteal and the menstrual phase so the luteal phase you are feeling more inward. Like I tell my husband, I'm in my luteal phase, I'm feeling more prickly and I'm going to want to be by myself more and not touched so mm -hmm. much. So I just let him know, it's not bad, it just yeah. is. Yeah. I'm doing internal work at mm -hmm. that time. I'm really focused. I wanna sit in my office with the door closed and just like get stuff done, but I don't wanna talk to anybody. And so that's hugely beneficial. And that is a time where our negativity bias will be more turned up. As a dear friend of mine said to me, uh, because PS, just like you said, it's a hologram, you can apply to everything. The, the same four phases are, are regarding, you know, pregnancy and birth. So like the first trimester of pregnancy is like the menstrual phase. It's, it's really, you're the most tired during that phase and it looks like nothing is happening, but you've actually made every organ of a human body. Oh my God, it's incredible. The second trimester yeah. is like the springtime, the follicular phase. Most women have the highest energy during that um, phase of pregnancy. The third trimester is like ovulation. It's really that full bloom energy. And then the fourth trimester is when the baby is actually outside you, but still very much attached to your body. And so that would be kind of like the autumn. And that is the time when uh, postpartum depression may be more likely, postpartum anxiety, um, those things. It's also the time in our year during autumn when seasonal affective disorder can be an issue for people. So there's yeah. like the macro and the micro going on all over the place here. Um, but my girlfriend told me when I called her a few days after Penelope was born and I was losing, losing my mind, I was right in this autumn of mm -hmm. my pregnancy journey. She said, she said, you can trust your feelings. You just can't trust the volume of them. And so it was so helpful. Right. And this is, oh, this wow. is That's for the luteal phase. It's like, you're right. Like, you, this is not your hormones. This is real. And also your hormonal state at this time will make it feel a little worse than it is. Mm -hmm. So just know that like the luteal phase right before your period may not be the time to make the big decisions about whether or not to leave your marriage or whether or not to quit your job or whatever. And then, and the, but it's really good information. Write down what irritates you during yeah. this time because that's great fodder to bring back into the bleeding phase mm -hmm. to reflect upon what, what if any changes need to be made in this cycle? What am I going, am I going to initiate any change during that next follicular phase? Um, what needs to actually happen, if anything. Oh, that's so, so interesting, fascinating. Get the information during luteal, but yeah. maybe don't do anything with that information until menstrual. Oh my God, that is so smart. My mom always used to say, never talk to anybody, like never have a serious conversation before you get your period. <laughs> and it's true. It's very hard to, because you want to do it, but maybe write it down so you get it off your chest, but just hold on, hold on, because it's just like, it's good to get it out but it may not be good to do anything about it at that point. But what's interesting is that it correlates, I guess like the textbook correlation to the moon is when the moon is getting darker and yeah. the light is getting more dim. So this isn't a time for absolute um, clear voicing of anything. So hold off, get it off your chest, release such wise, that's so smart. And then speaking of the moon, I was fascinated by what you had mentioned in your book about being away in college, like out in sea for two weeks where all you had was natural light. I think artificial light causes so many problems just in our sleep. There's so many people suffering from insomnia, but that's a whole other 
I mean, but that's part of the it's cycle. It's just a shorter cycle. Um, mm -hmm. So talk to us about how that impacted your cycle to have only natural light. Yeah. So, well, so actually, so here's the story. I did this semester away program in college um, where I lived as part of the crew of a schooner and we sailed 24 hours a day. And we also did oceanographic research 24 hours a day. So that was weird just from a sleep cycle yeah. perspective because, <laughs> because we did military watches. So like every three days we were rotating when we were sleeping and sometimes during the day, sometimes at night. So that was a little bit of a mess, but um, yeah. luckily I was, you know, <laughs> 20. So there was a lot yeah, more resilience there. A lot more. <laughs> yeah. But we were out, there was no artificial light. Like we had these little lights in our bunks, but honestly, we were so tired by the time we got in our bunks, we just passed out. So essentially we had the sun and we had the moon and we did not see land for weeks at a time. So like for up to 14 days, we would not see land or other ships. And there was one girl on our trip. She was actually the youngest, which is so interesting that all of the women started to sync up with her cycle. So also, I will just say, I don't think I wrote about this in the book because it sort of wasn't relevant, but I actually didn't get my period the entire time I was mm -hmm. out at sea. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was a combination of, I, I don't know, like, I think it was just sort of stress and whatever, like my body thought that would be inconvenient. <laughs> well, you also, your sleep was affected. My sleep was affected. I also lost a lot of body fat because I was, I was uh, hauling on lines all the time. It was like a really weird moment in my life. <laughs> but afterwards, <laughs> um, but afterwards, it, but but all the but the women synced up with the one woman who was sort of the alpha even though she was the youngest and she had always bled at the new moon and mm -hmm. so um everybody synced up around that which was really fascinating what's interesting was um i was always a blood mooner once i actually got my period regularly so i had um you know it's interesting that you were saying you didn't have your period the whole time you were there um, for me, I've always had like three month cycles since I got my period and went to the doctor and was given the pill and it was kind of like the same kind of thing. What's interesting is my mom read your mom's book and was very intrigued by natural medicine um, and eventually referred or found out about uh, an acupuncturist who specialized in gynecology. But when I went away, I went away for like three months backpacking in Europe. The whole time I was away, I didn't get my period. That's when I came back, I was around 25 and I said, mom, we have to do something. Um, my listeners have heard the story like a thousand times at least. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it was such a pivotal thing though, because it really was is a huge, um, all like reality altering event for me because I've gone to so many doctors, um, which is why I praise your mom so much because she's kind of in that face of that old world and she's so courageous and, and, expressing what she feels i think that takes a lot of courage to write books about that seriously and back in the day it was even tougher to break through uh, really? but yeah it was just an interesting thing but that's what got me into how important the cycle was you almost don't realize it when you're younger you take it for granted yeah it's a whole thing there yeah. is something you know it's the it's the age-old right like when you lose something, that's when you value it. It's true. There's a huge truth to it. So um, something that I loved in your book um, is egg wisdom. I would love for you to talk about that. It's just so cool. You could talk about that for hours in so many different ways and it's, it never gets old. <laughs> yeah, so egg wisdom um, was an idea originated by my mom and I asked if I could talk about it in Do Less and she was so excited to say yes. And so the concept is based on, um, I love the study of biomimicry. Now, biomimicry has been more applied to the design world. So it's really looking at our natural world mm -hmm. for solutions to human design problems. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of this in um, the world of sustainable ar um, architecture. You probably know more about that than I do. I wanted to do but, sustainable architecture, interestingly enough. <laughs> yeah, so there's this whole biomimicry you know, world in that field. However, there's a whole other way of applying it, which is looking, which is the way I think about it, is looking at what is going on in our natural world that can 
teach us through metaphor about who we are based mm. on our biology. So egg wisdom is really the way that ovulation works and the way that fertilization works is so fascinating, which is that um, the egg is you know dropped once a month uh, from the ovary and that's the moment of ovulation. And then the egg sits. So the egg doesn't go anywhere. The egg actually just sits and emits this very strong signal that goes all the way down to the cervix. So all the way down the fallopian tube, all the way through the uterus and all the way down to the cervix, which in a non-pregnant uterus, quite frankly, is not actually that long, but like to the size of the egg, it really is. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so that signal tells the sperm where she is and the signal actually has the ability to speed up the rate at which the sperm swim to her. So it's this really cool metaphor around that the egg knows what she wants and she emit, emits a very strong signal, letting it know where she is. And also her desire, that signal, actually speeds up the rate at which her desire swims to her. Now, once the sperm show up, they all, you know, you've probably seen those videos where they're all like, banging their heads against the against the membrane of the of the mm -hmm. egg and it looks as though it's the strongest sperm that makes it in which i'm sure is partly true however what's really fascinating is that the egg actually chooses which one she'll let in and That's so she has this very firm boundary but is also receptive to what she wants yeah she knows when it's right and so she lets in the sperm um, or sperms in the cultivals that she wants. And then if there's anything wrong with their DNA, she actually has the ability to repair it. So she enhances what shows up. And that sort of is the feminine principle is like making things is nurturing, making things more beautiful, mm -hmm. making things better. Um, and, and as my mom, Egging things on, which is very cheesy and cute. <laughs> um, and then once the egg is fertilized, she has enough nutrients to feed her and the sperm and travel all the way down the fallopian tube um, into the uterus and to embed in the uterine lining where, you know, the uterine lining will become the, so the source of nourishment. So the egg has all these qualities to sit and just be in mm. trust that her desire is coming. And then she has great boundaries for what's not for her, but really receptive for what is for her. And then she has the ability to make it even better and the ability to feed it and nourish it for several days to make it, you know, to keep it alive, to nourish her desire. And so egg wisdom is really this idea of asking when we're going for what we want, am I being the egg or am I being the sperm? Mm -hmm. And in our culture, we have been taught that the only way to get what we want is to be the sperm because yes. we live in a patriarchy that's hyper-masculine um, identified. So there's nothing wrong with the masculine. It's beautiful, right? And we're just too far over to that side. So for many of us, if we're like white knuckling our desires, you know, for the, for the partner, for the house, for the baby, um, whatever, like that, I, I really love asking, am I being the egg here? And mm -hmm. how could I be the egg? How could I be more in trust? How could I be more in relaxation? Now, of course, what we know about fertility is, you know, the more in pleasure we are and the more relaxed we are, the more likely it is that we will get pregnant, um, you know, for so many reasons. And so the egg wisdom really is the, the model for mm -hmm or how that works literally for pregnancy, but also for all the metaphorical desires that we want to call in. I mean, think about it this way, obviously baby making, in order to even have an orgasm, you have to let go. There, it has to, you have to have trust, yeah. complete trust. And of course I have this whole thing about oxytocin um, because oxytocin has been studied a lot more for pregnancy, for labor and also connection, but it hasn't been so much studied for fertility, but we do know that it increases during ovulation and it mm. also increases during orgasm. Why? Um, Chinese medicine has the heart uh, uterus connection and the heart's job is to open the uterus. And what is the heart? It's the love hormone. There's a connection. So it, it creates uterine contraction. It opens it 
for having the period. It opens it for labor. I believe it also opens it to receive life in. But in order to do that, <laughs> bless you. It's true. <laughs> You've heard that before, right? <laughs> A sneeze is confirmation. Um, but in order to, to do that, there has to be a sense of trust. And yeah, it's, it, it's obviously not easy when you're being taught to be the sperm all your life. And it's a whole different perspective. But even if it's difficult, doesn't mean it's impossible. That's what I really oh. want to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can practice in small ways all the time in my um, membership origin. We do this 11 week egg wisdom experience where we just deliver one little tidbit each week for 11 weeks of a way to practice being the egg. So, you know, one of them is to actually lean back. So literally and metaphorically, just notice in conversation, uh, in projects, are you leaning forward? Are you leaning in or are you leaning back? And how can you lean back a little bit more to actually embody that posture of yeah. trust? and receptivity, you know, so you can do it in small ways to remind yourself all throughout the day. Yeah. Have you heard of the concept of Wu Wei? No. Oh my God. I, I think you would love it because uh, it's effortless effort. It's basically the yin and yang and perfect harmony and balance. It's, um, it's what happens with birds when they fly using their wings and when they let go. So it's kind of this combination of effort, but effortless. And that's how nature works. It's very effortless. You really don't need to do much to be in this state of wu-wei. That's actually our natural state. That's why enlightened people say, actually, we're, we already are, we have that. We just are missing it because we're trying too hard. <laughs> so That's it's amazing. about being receptive and kind of leaning in. Um, so I just love that. So is there, I mean, you've shared so much wisdom already, but is there a word of wisdom you'd like to share with the listeners? Yeah. So really, you know, my whole message is just the importance of knowing that we are not, our worth is not determined by what we do, that our value, our worth is inherent. And so how can we be from that place? Like if you knew that you didn't have to prove anything, what would you do and how would you be? Mm. And that's really, that's really the question and, 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 and the statement to affirm that your worth is not determined by how you do your worth is by what you do. Your worth is inherent. Oh my God. I love that. That's something that actually, even to me speaks so much. I have to remind myself that as well, you know, being an entrepreneur and working and doing, um, it's just, it's something that I think everybody can stand. And I consider myself to be somebody who I practice meditation and I, you know, do as much walking the talk as I can. But even for me, that really kind of, I was like, wow, I really need to ask myself that question every day, really in a cycle. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Um, so if people want to take your courses, um, how can people find you? Yeah, so you can way. come over to katenorthrup.com. Um, if you go to katenorthrup.com forward slash list, there is a free do less weekly planning guide, mm -hmm. um, which will set you up with the elements of the do less methodology to understand how they work together to set up um, your, to set up your life on a mm -hmm. weekly basis. And then um, you can follow me over on Instagram at Kate Northrup. That's the place I hang out on social media the most. And what's the egg wisdom one? Um, where, where can people find that one? Cause that sounds oh, really that's interesting. In my membership origin. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know when this is going live, but mm -hmm. you can go to origincollective.com and either the doors will be open or there'll be a wait list there. Okay. For when. Yeah. All right. I'll have all of these links up in the episode notes. So if anybody wants to, they can always find them there. Um, this has been such a pleasure. I was very excited for this interview. Um, you're just awesome to talk to. I could talk to you for hours. I think like everything that you've been mentioning, my mind goes in a million different directions and thinking about everything. So it's just so interesting and um, fascinating, such a fascinating topic. The whole women energy, the cyclical aspect of the world and us and nature and how we're so much more part of nature than we realize or acknowledge. So thank you for bringing that awareness to my listeners and for sharing your book and inspiring so many people. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
I really appreciate it.